my brother had married a girl whose father was the superintendent for Marsh and Knutson Road Work in Arizona and New Mexico. So immediately he got involved in road work. And when his father-in-law retired, Marsh and Knutson hired him, probably 28, 30 years old, as their general superintendent for that area. And he built up quite a reputation throughout that area. And uh, Marshall Knudsen, I don't know exactly the details because I wasn't around that much, but he became his own contractor. And uh, at that point in time, he probably was maybe the second largest road contractor in Arizona. And it was on an anniversary date, and I'm going to say 66, because I was going out to Arizona once a month, and I would fly in to Phoenix, rent a car, go up, or either, you know, one way I was visiting with them, and sometimes I'd go out and stay the whole weekend, maybe an extra day. And so his wife picked me up at the airport. He was coming in from Tucson and it was their anniversary, so that was in May, and uh, we were sitting around with about 10 family members that were friends of his in his business, and, uh, and during the conversation, he looked at his wife and said, you're ready to move to Tucson, because he had offices both in Tucson and Phoenix, and she was kind of, yes, yeah, she was in nursing school, and that's where the better nurse. And so uh, the story is, there was a man in Arizona, he had a contract buying the hot oil out of Long Beach, heavy oil, and it was railroaded to Tucson in heater railroad cars. And then he had a fleet of heated transports. And so it was the asphalt oil. Like, like Bunker C. You know, or Bunker yeah, C, yeah, the heavy yeah. stuff. And then they were hauling on a steady basis to the uh, power plant in El Paso. And the man had died. And Pete, my brother Garland, only knew him by contact at conventions and get together of contractors. And he bought his asphalt from him. And apparently, it was to his wife, if you can no longer manage the bill, the business, make arrangements to turn that business over to my brother. So basically it was given to him and he got immediately got a new 10-year contract with Standard Oil to secure that 10-year contract of bringing the oil into Tucson. And with that, he leased all of his trucks. And he used Peterbilt trucks. At the point in time when he died, he had 76 Peterbilt heater trucks hauling asphalt and heavy oil. He had about 80 dry cargo crushing material and coal out of the four corners, hauling coal down to Glen Cottonwood, Clarksdale, and to Albuquerque. And uh, then he had the crushing plants with the little portable that you take to a job site, you know, it's a mixture of asphalt. So he had that, the crushing plants, uh, he had the hot oil, and he had three contracting firms, companies. One for interstate federal work, one for state work, and one for city municipal work. And when he passed away, there was a, one man with him that was kind of a business partner where people would put people in business, kind of the shake of the hand, 
with a letter in his billfold. He carried a trifold, I call it, you know, billfold like that. And uh, a fellow from the governor's office, I don't remember his position. And uh, after the, at the funeral, there were people came to me, all kind of anything you need help. And uh, then, here, I'll get it straight just because she caught me kind of off guard there. Uh, we could not find a new will that he had written. And the man that was kind of his business partner had already told Mother, Dad, and I what was in the will. But we never, a new will, but we never could find it. And the girl that had typed it <laughs> didn't keep copies of it because it was his personal, not his business affairs through the law office. And you know, we found the old will that he had made up 25 years ago, something like that. Well, shortly after that, Beverly, they had divorced. The three children were under age, according to the will, to get their inheritance. And uh, so a person contacted Beverly and Garland had hired a man, first time he'd ever hired a man to actually, kind of like a general manager. And uh, they were contacted by people to, will help you get rid of the business, you know. And uh, so uh, the kids called Dad to come out because they wanted, let me put it this way, they didn't trust their mother. <laughs> and so they met it her home, their home that had been there. And around the table were three people, lawyers and CPAs, explaining what they would do. We'll bring in a general manager, we'll get a, a it'd been 10 years, get a new 10 year contract and uh, help you, you know, then get everything back stable and, you know, help you find a person to buy it. So my dad, well, how much is it going to cost them? Nothing. Okay. So then they left. They had to stand around. And uh, Beverly had already met Rosaline Bonato, Bill Bonato's wife. But uh, a few days later, Beverly said, Rosaline and I are going on something and uh, anything you want to do, I've got a driver for you. And Dad said, I want to go to Tombstone. And on the back of that picture, you may not have it in that group, but it's loose. A driver carried Dad to Tucson, I mean to a Tombstone. And he had a picture to prove that the, the theater was a single story instead of two right, stories. Right, right. Okay, he got that story. So he had right. a picture to prove. That's what he wanted to prove that it was two story at one time. And uh, so when they got back, instead of going to the house, they went to Mr. Bonato's house. And Dad missed it with him and the next day or two he sent the driver over to come over and have brunch with me go swimming with me have a brandy i'm sure and he had a gigantic rose garden that was one of his pride and joy and uh, with that he gave dad his autobiography that he had just published and so dad comes home and read the book, gave it to me to read. He's a great guy. When you read the book, you get a different perspective of the month. You, in other words, you get that side of the story. And over the next several years, mother was already to the point she couldn't travel. I mean, she was still at home, but she didn't want to travel. She did go to the funeral of my brother. But when Dad would go out, 
Mr. Bonanno would send the car over, come over and have brunch with me around the pool and let's visit and, you know, just, as Dad said, he got grandkids too and we'd talk about our grandkids and, you know, so to Dad, he was just a, another old man. They were enjoying their, and then Dad had read the story and so that opened up some conversation on that and, and that was the method of contact. And then within a short time, they sold the business for him and, you know, got it restructured and everything and, uh, I always think that that fellow that he hired about three months before he passed away, he was, I, I call it a typical Doc Holiday. You're a well-established businessman back east. You come down with TB, go west, young man, to the dry climate, and immediately he made contact with Garland. Garland hired him. His wife was a CPA from somewhere where New Jersey, I think it was. And so Garland hired her. Every business and every piece of property he had were in a separate corporate entity using a different CPA <laughs> for each one. <laughs> and he hired her to put it all together. And she had it on a 13 column spreadsheet, like 13 column balance sheet and P and L statements. And when he passed away, she delivered me her that sheet of paper and her work papers. And I showed it to my CPA and he said, I've never seen anything like it or never heard of a person operating that way. But that guy disappeared. And uh, I had numerous conversations with the, what they call county attorney out there, which we would call him district attorneys around here and the uh, governor's chief of staff on assets that he apparently owned. And uh, one time the uh, lady lawyer for the major, well, most of his companies, she said, I understand you can help us find Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. And I said, well, uh, Yes, but uh, I'm going to do like everybody else. We had quite a very sickening, embarrassing situation at the funeral. And uh, I said, I'm going to be like everybody else. $25,000 cashier's check delivered to my attorney friend. And when he receives it, I will give him the name and locale, you can locate these couple. Wasn't worth it to them. But she said, oh, you're from Louisiana, yeah. Oh, I'm from Lake Providence. Oh, yeah, I do some work at Lake Providence. Oh, my daddy is on the council over there. Oh, yeah, I know him. So that was my contact there, but they never would. And I would not give it to them because what I saw at the funeral, mm -hmm. that's I, I, my airplane, not his airplane. This is my apartment, not his, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean. you, you mentioned mm -hmm. flounder gigging and the rope okay. and the hawser. That's, oh, another, that's another good story. Well, there's two stories there on flounder. Okay. Florida Roberts, right? Yeah. He floundered along the lighthouse shore. And he put down big hawsers. And the flounder as they were moving, of course, when they hit it, they're gonna bed down there. And so he had his little route. He would walk the route and gig his flounder and everything was fine. That's the way he would do it. But it all of a sudden became illegal to do things like that. And one day the game warden was found floating in the water with two holes in him right here and that was the end of the story. <laughs> Where were the holes made by? A weapon or a gunshot? Or? A gig. A gig. Mm -hmm. oh. The uh, the spear for the... Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, supposition. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nobody could prove Nobody anything. Nobody knew anything. <laughs> but uh, 
he apparently that was one of his big methods of you know getting fish. And it was a big floundering, was a big operation. I can find the cut on that map. One time Dad and I went out there and literally on our hands and knees as the flounder were coming off of the flats back in it looked like the lighthouse lake they call it. And we were literally on hands and knees just using an ice pick, catching them on the go. Mm, mm, mm. And had a skiff mm. anchored right there and just throwing them into the skiff. Oh my Marley. Whoa. Whoa. And then another flounder story is the one down in the Laguna Madre, but we'll get into that here later. But I mean, floundering was a, it was, there were a few people did it commercially, but it was a sportsman, my wife's uncle, I mean, that was his, during that fall period of the year, what is it, August, September? In the run. When the? November. November, when the flounder. The run out. Uh, I mean, he was, he lived over at the Angleside, he'd go down to Old Angleside, there was area there. I mean, <laughs> He'd be floundering two or three nights a week, and you know he may get a, a tub full, and he'd he'd sell them, but he did it for the sport of it primarily. And uh, people operate now to ranches; they would come out the channel and go into some of those flats there, and all those flats there behind the lighthouse. I think it, I'd never heard it called the lake. The trails, the yeah, but trails. all of that was just fabulous fishing, but. Most people didn't know how to get in and out and mobile out there, and uh, so Dad kind of had a captive market for his during the off season, so to speak. And then after he gave up his duck hunting, I mean that whole area is one of his favorite. And he had a well, you have the picture of him. Little aluminum. No, boat. it's a, a gray boat, red trim, and him holding a redfish. He had that boat for probably 18 years, and. Uh, so he knew all that stuff just like you know your backyard. So he had the advantage over mm -hmm. even the local people because he grew up in it. Mm -hmm. And of course it changes over the years with the hurricanes and I guess now it has a few oil ditches in it. Mm -hmm. But uh, Let's see if you have some other stories relative to uh, what Port Aranja celebrates and, and commemorates and thinks about a lot, at least Mark and I and some other folks, and that is the World War II experiences in Port Aranja. We had the famous guns in the dunes, oh, yeah. you might recall that. You were nine years old when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Right. And you were, um, in that in that time, you were, your dad was actively, 1940 was his first trip, and so we're talking about about just the start of the war at the start of offshore fishing. Those two yep. dates are pretty close together. Well, he had actually started in 24, but it was sometime Port Aranges, sometime Aranges. But 1939 yes. is when the Lucille and from then on exactly. was totally full. And I'm celebrating that this yeah, all so the end. We're going to start in 39. Tell us a little bit about the fishing during the war years. Was it active then? Was it the people? Oh, yeah. As far as Dad was concerned, okay. I mean, that was the beginning of his sail fishing. Yes. And uh, you had, and I think I asked one of the guys over at the Marine School, is that the building that, I guess it was a Coast Guard, you had to stop going out and stop coming in? It was actually what is called the Harbor Entrance Com Control Post, HECP. Okay. And it was operated by the Coast Guard and the Navy. Okay. They, and but you had to stop there, and of course those people like Dad, they were every day, it was no more than probably, you know, waving by. And uh, so yes, it was, as far as that goes, the war was no break as far as Dad was concerned. All right. And, you know, some of the other activity, I don't know, I can't say that there were any major increases in charter fishing during that right. period of time. But one of the stories... Excuse me, wife, Mr. Mentor, do you know why the boats were stopped? Yes, for security purposes. Because early in the war, and this story is well documented as well as going on down the New Orleans area and the Biloxi area, uh, the PBYs that were flying patrol for submarines. They would 
me and say a mile, a mile from the beach out where the shrimp boats operated. And they would see a little or a big mud street where the shrimp were stirring it up. And they would drop their little wooden metal tip flare bombs to the shrimper. And the shrimper would go over there and put his net over and fill up in one drag and go home. Well, the plane dropped his bomb and kept going. So one of Granddad's personal boats went over and dropped his net, and it wasn't shrimp, it was submarine. And the submarine surfaced, the guys got on deck, cut their net loose, flipped a few hats or something to the shrimp boat, and uh, of course I'm sure the uh, boatmen were quite shook up <laughs> that's on the shrimp boat, and they came in, and of course the first report was there at that station, that they had seen, literally seen, I mean the boat came to the surface, and they cut the net away from the submarine. And it well, was, you haven't said it. it was a German submarine. Yes, it, oh yeah, it was a German submarine. And, and uh, about how far off? Or, well, I'm going to say less than a mile, but oh. the boats didn't go out that far. <laughs> okay. In other words, most of the shrimp boats were shrimping with eye, within eye view. What's eye view? Maybe two miles? Mm -hmm. well, you know, a small shrimp boat. So the boat, and it was about dark when it got into the fish house. And Granddad was living in the house on top of the hill, and uh, the word had filtered to my brother and I that something had happened, and there was a bunch of military people at the Granddad's house. And so we jumped on our bike and went down there, and they were there from say basically dark up until late, late in the evening of night interviewing the boatmen that were on that boat. Now the rest of the story is that they thought they actually got the boat in this area, but it went on down off of the New Orleans coast and there was actually two submarines in the work in the Gulf. And uh, it shot and sank a passenger ship. And yeah, they finally got both submarines and they only here in the last 10 years found the, the second one. It was big in the, even our little local paper, but it was big articles in the uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge paper. So that, I always thought it was just one ship or one sub. But there were two, and, there was and this would have been in 42? In the early, early part of the war, yeah. That was what the war started in, uh, Pearl Harbor, 41, so this was, and I'm going to guess that was 42 because that was the, the submarine war, you know, the Gulf. Mm -hmm. would, would you think that when you were over at your, at the house and the military guys were there, would that be during your school year? Was it in the February, March? Would it be winter in 42? You know, I just, uh, to me, there wasn't that much season, unless we had a big norther, I guess you'd say. Yeah. I, I just don't remember. Okay. But I do remember the word filtered up to the house. Maybe Daddy had come in from offshore fishing, mm -hmm. and of course he heard about it immediately and came home, and then he headed down to the mm -hmm. waterfront to talk to Granddad. You know, just everybody accumulated on the waterfront because mm -hmm. the word spread pretty rapidly. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we were restricted for a long time from that point on. The used to have the the, brick, the uh, fishing pier right at the jetty, and then you had the second one down, which that road came up past the rock cottages. So from that from that point on, we could not even go past that to uh, beach fish, swim. So we were restricted between the jetties in that pier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by the uh, shore patrol, or the beach patrol. Yeah, yeah. well, military, I'd yeah. say. Do you remember the, the dune guns, the guns that were in the oh, dunes? Definitely. Can you see them, in those emplacements? Oh, yeah. Of 
course, we couldn't go to them. I mean, they were there. Uh, you could see them right. sticking out and see there was one there. See, 18 miles and it's an island. One another about halfway down and then one, I think, right at the Corpus Pass. So there, and there may have been one over on St. Joe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the uh, the military presence in Port Aransas? Was there barracks? Were there, what was the complex like? And I don't remember her name, but she had a nice motel. And her husband was dead. And she had a real nice dining room suit. And the, I don't remember whether they were the Navy or the Coast Patrol. They commandeered her motel. And she did not want that dining room suit to be left there with the military tearing it up. So she told Dad he could have it, and he said, no, I'm going to pay you for it. So there was a big argument over that. So he eventually agreed, or she agreed, to take one day of sail fishing, $25 for it. And uh, so it was in storage through the war, and in '46, Dad built a house and uh, out of scrap lumber, out of a barracks down at the Matagorda Island and built the house to fit that dining room suit. And I still have it. It is our main dining room suit. Mm -hmm. The chairs still have the original upholstery in it. And so, answer your question, that's the way they, mm -hmm. I'm sure they did other motels that way too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to know where it was, but now I don't know where anything is. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even find the rock cottages last night. <laughs> <laughs> what was the military presence in Aransas Pass? Was there... Uh, Felix Turnbow, who became chief of police, I guess he even became mayor at one time, and Charlie Marshall, they were shore patrol that showed up walking the streets in Aransas Pass mm -hmm. and met local girls and married them and the rest is history. So other than shore patrol, and I'm sure there were others too, mm -hmm. but yes, we did see shore patrol in Ranch Pass mm -hmm. during the war. And maybe, you know, maybe not till the end of the war, but especially in the early part of the war. Right. And I mean, we even had, uh, I remember we had to put sheets and blankets over your mm -hmm. windows, and we had an old lady down the street that was a blackout warden, and boy, she had walked the streets, and she saw a little peak of light coming out of your house. She came in and raised all kinds uh -huh. of hell. And, uh -huh. So that wasn't just along the coast. That was back in Aransas Pass, yeah, too. Yeah, that huh? was our experience at Aransas Pass. We got mad at her one time, and she had an outhouse. We went over and turned the outhouse over, and she was in it. <laughs> little kid, a little, you know, a little humor there, but... Uh, Mm -hmm. She was kind of the mean old lady, you know, because she was our area, and I'm sure there was one on the other side of town, and one mm -hmm. in Ingleside. Of and, course. Uh, yeah. oh, sure. I, I had to step to the restroom. The reason that they stopped the outgoing boats was to be sure that those vessels were not carrying more fuel or food than would warrant their trip. Basically, that's correct. Because uh, they might be resupplying you boats. And I had read that in the log from that HECP, yeah. which is what you're referring to right there by the engineer's pier. Yeah. And that you weren't bringing anything in. I don't know what you could be bringing in unless so you could bring in messages. That you Matter of fact, in. my understanding is that the boats had access in, it was out in which they were interested in stopping. Okay. And when they came in, they had to come in with a signal. There was a recognition signal when you came in, yeah. and that might have been by flag or by flasher. I, I really you, don't know I wasn't. But your dad was fishing doing the oh, yeah, He was out there. Never missed a day. Never missed unless a day. Unless it was real, real bad weather. And so they're just folks that had the money and they weren't out involved in the draft. They weren't going overseas and they just wanted to fish. Dad's customers, I guess you'd almost say from the very beginning, were the ranchers and the oil and gas people. The old Umble was uh, one of his big early day customers. His double cousin's husband, Hal Parks, 
was the marketing manager for this area. He had the then he had the service station there, which is now the chamber office. And uh, her mother had the Minard Hotel, which is gone. And uh, then the fellow by the name of Ray Stevens was dad's age. And he was the VP of marketing for Humble. And uh, his father-in-law was the, uh, I guess you call him an oil scout, that recognized in 39 that we we're going to be needing a tremendous amount of oil to supply the war effort. And I could go down and make a deal with Dick Clairbird if you'll you know, give me the authorization. Well, the boss said no. So the story is that he goes to Houston over his boss's head, and uh, they said, okay. So he went down and made a deal with the Claybergs for the exclusive drilling and production rights of the King Ranch. Yes. And of course, with that achievement, then they started to drilling, getting oil, and piping it into the refinery at Ingleside, or into the, we used to have three pipelines coming ranches, you know, along the causeway to the uh, docks over here. Now, the Fina, they used to call them, or later, the Fina docks, the, the, yeah, the oil were, tanks, the big storage were, tanks. Well, they were, everything was humble back in those yes. days. Yeah. Then, uh, I don't know the man's name, but his son-in-law, Ray, uh, with his father-in-law, began to move up quite rapidly. Uh, he was approached by the Bremer O'Connor compound, mm -hmm. which I think is seven, eight hundred thousand acres mm -hmm. of the combine. <laughs> uh, the old man have died and we need a bunch of money to pay taxes on. We don't have it. Will you make a deal with us? Well, by that point in time, he was able to influence the decision. And so all of the production in the uh, Bremer O'Connor land is Exxon, I guess you'd call it today. Mm -hmm. And so the day that Kennedy was killed, he was chairman of the board. And Ray was senior executive VP of marketing. And at the time of the Exxon Valdez, Bill, Ray's boy, who was high school, college, whatever it was called at that time, I think it was a period of time it was called ESO. Humble to Exxon. Yes, so, yes. right. uh, Bill was president of Exxon. I had gone to two years of junior college, three years of service, worked, went to school, and Bill just showed up, and we were in the same graduating class. So he's about five years younger than I am. And uh, when the Exxon Valdez, they were doing the testimony, Dad happened to be with us up in Monroe, and I'm watching it, and hollered to my wife, and uh, she knew Bill, because we were classmates, only 21 of us in our class. I said, hey, honey, Bill Stevens on TV. And Dad sat in there and said, oh, that's Ray's boy. <laughs> and so the Dad told me the story of the relationship there, which I did not know. And so that's the way this fellow elevated himself quite rapidly to the chamber of, chairman of the board and Ray moved up and then Bill, his son, moved up to president quite rapidly. So you have a family relationship. But Bill was a sacrificial ant lamb for the Exxon family. Yeah, yes, he someone, got someone had to fall on that. Tell us a little bit about that uh, tournament in uh, Port Isabel. Port Isabel. <clears throat> okay, it was the same family that fished with the tournament here with Dad for many years. And the, tur the tournament people, as Dad recalled it to me because I made the trip with him, asked him to come down for the tournament. And so Dad immediately contacted the Adairs and they wanted to go, man and wife, and then Mary Brammer, 
harbor, uh, and another boat that this one from Fort Worth. And uh, the arrangements were made, and uh, two days before, you know, two days before the tournament, we Dad led the flotilla, as you'd say, across Corpus Bay through the swing barge. And at the dry cut, we had to wait about two hours. The barges, I mean, the dredges were still. What's the dry cut? Mansfield? Where, where do you uh, go? Dry, the dry cut is below Baffin's Bay. The dry cut. Okay. Just write the dry cut down and we'll come back to that because that's it, a major story. There's a big, there's a big opening of water. And then when you get down to Port Mansfield, it opens out again. But in between there, there's this very narrow cut that runs to through right. there. That is a but, story based on Eisenhower over here. Keep talking. Keep, keep talking. Okay, so we go down. We made it to Port Mansfield. Dad had made arrangements for a fuel truck to be there so we could all fuel up. And we stayed docked there. Uh, Mr. and Miss Adair went over and slept on the boat of their friend. And the next morning, uh, they got up and uh, Mrs. Adair climbed on one of the other boats. And of course, it was just like driving down the interstate on the Port Isabel. And uh, we wanted to try the fishing along the line. And Dad had a big, massive live bait well. So he had a gallon of live shrimp. And uh, just as we left Port Mansfield, we began to come into an area uh, where there was good, nice water on both sides. Of course, the channel was very identified, water clear as a crystal. And so we would flip up on the kind of the shallow water, you know, like that, and pull a bait corked line with live shrimp. And just the minute it hit the, you got a trout or redfish, I mean, every cast. <laughs> Well, and we'd catch one or two fish and we'd go down a quarter of a mile and we'd stop again. I mean, he'd never anchor, he'd just leave the boat engine running and all three of us would cast out and maybe catch two, they'd catch six fish and we'd go on down. And all of a sudden we cast up on the bank. Now here I'm talking about eight, nine o'clock in the morning and you couldn't get your bait out, you had a flounder. And so he didn't cast as far, so he catch redfish, but you still catch a flounder. Well, all of a sudden we look up and here's a big plywood sheet saying, Willisie Cameron County Line. So Dad kind of moved over to the sign, the post. Water was about this deep. He could still slowly move. And he said to Mr. Adair and me, he said, dark 30, on Sunday night, wrote the tournament was over on Sunday. We're going to be right here. The state air said, "Well, I'd love to, but I'm, we're going home." We didn't have a gig. We didn't have anything to put the flounder on. Uh, Dad got some mop panels, bought some ice picks, <laughs> wrapped them up, single ice pick, and we made it there just dark thirty dropped an anchor, or tied up to it, then dropped, pulled back, back, dropped an anchor so the boat wouldn't swing. And uh, couldn't wait to get overboard because we looked down and saw flounder moving. And uh, he took his sailfish teaser line, and uh, that's what we used for a stringer. And we got off and started to move, and it just got so excited, you're, you know, you're gigging on the go most of the time. And after a few minutes, you begin to see them kind of bedding down. And uh, finally, I stuck one that was bedded down, and the fish went that way, and I went down into the water. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Dad said, we need to go back and organize ourselves a little better. So we go back to the boat, and he had a bench that he could fold up and would lay beside the inside of the boat. So like duck hunting, he'd pulled the boats out, he had two benches. So they were part of the boat. And they were made to fit across the stern of the boat. So he had put two 300 pound blocks of ice back there, covered with canvas. And so that's where we threw the flounder. 
And so we began to go back, waited a little later, the fish would begin to bed down, but still moving. And he finally said, I'll hold the lantern and the stringer and you straddle the fish when you gig it and set down on it because we were going to start getting those. I mean, literally they would not fit in a, a <laughs> Sound big like big wash stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally. And so that's what I would do. I would stick mm -hmm. it and sit down on it. And <laughs> Dad would eventually get it down so he could run a string through its gills. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just kept going. We'd go back to the boat every, almost every hour, I guess, and just throw them over and in that ice. And mm -hmm. he had a scupper hole that he could unplug so the water could run out. And uh, we were approaching daylight, we were tired and pooped, and he said, we need to take off, and all of a sudden we saw a towboat coming. And as it got close enough, of course, Dad had the little light on, he turned all of his lights on and honked his horn a couple of times, and it was a LWR towboat, Dad knew the captain, and he hollered, can I hitch a ride to Rangers? And so we rode behind him all the way and we cut loose at the Twain Bridge. And then we went on in, his boathouse was on the south end, but we went to the fish house and uh, we had right at 900 pounds flounder. <laughs> and so uh, <clears throat> that was uh, just before, probably in, just before I went to school. It was in mid to late August. How was the sail fishing? How was the sail? Well, I, we, I, caught, as well. we caught two fish in the three days, and I don't remember. Everybody had a great time. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other people, they parted with the, uh, and the eight airs, they parted with everybody, I guess, mm -hmm. at the country club if they had one. I don't know. Dad and I stayed on the boat and made it ready, and still using those silk lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, so with that, for the rest of the season, Dad, I went down and took people down to, uh, down into that area of Flounder, and then the tubes came over, and they would come from Uvalde with their pickups with ice, old ice boxes full of ice, and every night they'd, after floundering, they'd come in there to put their fish in there, and the Mexicans would drive the boat of the fish back to Uvalde, and then Joe Massey had the largest shrimp boat in ranches at that time, and it was not built like the typical shrimp boats. It was real low, real wide, real flat bottom. So uh, he uh, fixed up some bumps on the boat. Of course, he had the shrimp well, or shrimp where he that, so he put the ice down there, and he would tow a boat, and Dad would tow a boat, and they'd have four people to take fishing, and they'd go down for, you know, three days of fishing, and they kept all the fishing on ice in the shrimp boat, and uh, the party would take what they wanted, you know, but they, they sold the fish, you know, at the market. And so uh, I was off, went off to school then, and so the dad continued to operate until duck season started, so most of his work then for that August till duck season started was done in Laguna. You mentioned the name Eisenhower relative to Laguna Madre? Or okay. Isabel, or? I know about the ranch house. Okay, part of the agreement that was made of uh, Sam Rayburn, Dick Clayburg, and uh, uh, Sid Richardson was that we'll have Supreme Court decisions confirming that Texas has 12 mile limit. Everybody else has three mile limit. Uh, will have a confirmation that Texas, if they choose, can divide into three states. And Dick Clayburg wanted the decision that. The deed says, starting at the water's edge to a point, to a point, to a point, to a point, back to the water's edge, and to the point of beginning along the water's edge. Okay, the 1916-1919 Hurricane leveled Padre Island and created this several tens of thousands of acres of just nothing but sand, 
which is where the dry cut was cut through. So the King Ranch in that Supreme Court ruling, your deed says to the water's edge, so it comes down and cuts through the dry land and goes to the Gulf Beach and back and there. So they picked up several tens of thousands of acres, which eventually, if you look at an aerial view, I think I saw one at the hotel, there's about four ditches that cross and then they branch out where they drill well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the King Ranch picked up all of that land. So well, that was part of the deal. No. Let's see, the three mile limit, the, the, that, uh, the Texas Division and that. That's the reason your governor here several months back said, by God, we'll su succeed or yeah, that we can, in other words, our charter from the Texas Republic becoming the state says that they have the right to secede and they have the right to divide into five states. So that was the decision made and that's when your governor said here several months back, mm -hmm. well, if they don't like it, we will mm -hmm. secede or create five states and mm -hmm. give us mm -hmm. 10 senators and, you know, mm -hmm. would create the work. So that's the reason he was so. People said, "Oh, he's an arrogant." I mean, overnight he's an arrogant SOB. Well, he knew what he knew that I just told you mm -hmm. that most people, you know, wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. So that was mm -hmm. that. And so they said, "Dad used his boat to the Lucille to call back and forth of the white collar people." I guess you'd say. Yeah, the negotiators. Of the, yeah, the new yeah. Deal, sure. Great. So there's a lot of history, you know. There is a lot of history. And another history of Eisenhower as a young, uh, he was doing pilot training where up in uh, Fort Sam Houston. Fort Sam Houston. They were coming, there used to be a big a hotel down on Old Legal Side Point. And the, pilot, the guys, they'd fly down there and land on the beach. And the girls would come from Baylor Belton on the train, and that's where I met Amy. Amy. At the uh, Ingleside facility. Uh huh. But uh, they just landed on the beach. Yeah. I guess they were, uh, what, biplanes back in those days and hotshot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, students. Wow. And, uh, I mean, Dad, Dad was of that same age, so he was <clears throat> running over hmm. there too as. Big party, right. but all that facility was right. Right. destroyed later on. Hmm. I'm winding down, Mark. What do you think? <clears throat> that map does not work for the dry cut. Doesn't go far south. The uh, I have one other little quick. Please, please do. Little quick one. Please do. Starting, I'm going to say. I became a Cub Scout when I was nine years old, and. Uh, the parks, two boys, in other words, they were kin to us through like this. And we had about eight or ten in our little group. Mm -hmm. And so Dad took a day off, put us on the books, just like a paid customer, mm -hmm. and brought us over to the lighthouse. And eventually it was other people began to join us, but we would have ten, twelve kids on the boat. Mm -hmm. And we would make little trips to the lighthouse every summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, I'm going to say, up till 44, even. Uh, say 40, I have written here 41, 2, 3, 4. And uh, for drop fishing? Did he take over there for drop fishing? Or? No, he just take us to just, the lighthouse for a tour right. of the lighthouse. We'll take a tour of the lighthouse. Well, yeah, nobody else did except. Somebody like Dad would take somebody over. Can't do that now. Well, it's private owned. Private owned. But, but the, was the Coast Guard running the oh, dam? Yeah, it was Coast Guard. Okay, that's right. And see, Dad, as a real youngster, he tells about going over and spending a month in the summertime, and his job was to polish all of this brass stairwell. That was a, just a job that mm -hmm. bird, mm -hmm. they called it bird. 
that you have every summer. So he went over there and got paid mm -hmm. and lived at the mm -hmm. lighthouse. And uh, <laughs> so he could tell the story and he could tell you exactly how many stairs there were I mean, going up. So when I made that copy of the uh, mapping mm -hmm. of the lighthouse, I sent a copy of it to Mr. Butt and told him the story of how we, as kids, and he wrote me and said that he had an original and he had appreciated the story of, and how my dad was so nice to take his kids over there and, you know. So, I mean, it was a nice letter. But, yeah. uh, I mean, it's just a little story that's part of my life. Absolutely. That probably a lot of kids in Puerto Rangers never even had the opportunity. No, they didn't. Oops, um, they just didn't. No. They just didn't. There's the Laguna Madre, and here's Port Mansfield, and there's the dry cut right there. Right off the King Ranch. When you look at it in an area photo, you can see the massiveness of it, huh? Yeah, there's just so much sand there. Yeah. 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 Well, I see, uh, the area photo that I've looked at shows you can see the area, the cuts in the. Uh, uh, we just didn't get down that far when we were flying, did we? No. We just didn't get down that the, the, uh, Also, you know, something else that somebody's very interesting, <clears throat> Dr. Watson, when he was working on his, he's a, a geologist. Um, here, I'm going to. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, when it, I get it. Is a. Uh, right over there, and I'll leave against it. Uh, He's a coastal geologist, and one of his things that he noticed is that there was way more inflow from the, down there at Port Mansfield, the Mansfield cut, and uh, down towards Port Isabel, than outflow of the tides. Inflow, okay. It wasn't equal. And what, and what they found out on his doctoral thesis and everything else was that there's a circulation and what happens is the southeast wind. Excuse me, I got it. Straight, straight ahead. And when you say that, yeah. don't forget yeah, there's, okay. an, there's another story involving uh, Dan Eman and the Mansfield cut. Do you think that dry cut was was cut by the 16 and 19 storms? No, I think I think um, this. Well, I think all this at one point was just solid sand. Mm -hmm. And then the intracoastal waterway went through there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is right there. Yeah. These are flats now. Is this real time? Am I? Uh, oh, no, th no, this is Google Maps. Oh, Google Maps. Oh, Google Maps. Well, Google Maps. well, that's, yeah. yeah. It's Bye. fairly current. Satellite pictures. 2010 imagery, Terra metrics. Very nice. That's very clear. Let's see it. Okie dokie. The sky was a fascinating. fascinating. Mm -hmm. Got another U boat story. Got another U boat story. In the nets. The problem with that story, Mark, is that.